Uh, how are you all? Good. I'm Pretty fine. Good. How are you, Matt? Good. <laughs> um, that's a look. So, today uh, I'm going to talk about a uh, PowerPoint slide that doesn't work. Cool. <laughs> Very exciting. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> virtual reality, back to the future. Who here knows what virtual reality is? Me. Somewhat. Okay. Uh, who here has used it before? Right. I was getting smaller. Uh, when did you use it? Yesterday. Today? <laughs> Today? Five years ago? ago? Four years ago? Okay. Right. So in recent years, the virtual reality has changed a lot. Um, I would say that this year is the first year where we really understand how virtual reality should be. Um, people in the past say, oh, get sick, it doesn't feel really good, and there are reasons for that, for which I will go into. Yeah. First, introductions, my name is Matt. I am not a professional anything apart from teacher. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I am very, very passionate about virtual reality and all the things it can do. Uh, digital creation is my thing. Um, and virtual reality allows you to create whole worlds that makes you convince them wherever you want to be. So that's very useful. So, moving on. What is VR? The computer-generated simulation of a three-dimensional image of an environment that can interact with a seemingly real <laughs> person using special equipment such as a helmet with a screen inside or gloves fitted with sensors. Or... <coughs> Digitally replacing your world with something cooler. <laughs> That's basically it. Now, to understand VR, we need to know what makes a good experience. Uh, that has been very difficult, um, especially when they started in the 90s, when the technology was not even close to being good enough. After that, I'm going to talk about uh, a bit of a history, very, very quick history, with not much time, incidentally. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the practical applications of virtual reality in the world outside of lighting things up with lightsabers. Um, so, moving on. Replacing reality is very difficult. We failed in the past because the technology or even the ideas weren't there. That said, our brains are ridiculously gullible. We will be convinced of anything as long as the certain minimum requirements are met. We'll go into some of those. Uh, now, one of the biggest issues is virtual reality sickness. Um, anyone who's done it in two years before, three years before, ten years before, definitely, will find that uh, virtual reality sickness is when you will basically feel motion sick. Uh, this is because your brain is telling you one thing and your body is saying something very, very different. So when you're walking in virtual reality, your brain is going, uh, body is going, uh, no, you're really not. This is due to a balanced thing in your ear, the vestibular system, I think it's called. Yeah, that's the one. That is in control of your balance and spatial orientation. Now, there are many ways to get around this problem, and they've figured some out. Not all, but they're getting there. So, virtual immersion. Another word you will hear in virtual reality is presence. Presence is the feeling of being there. Um, that is extremely important, uh, difficult to do, but once you get it, it's pretty cool. So, I've had to cut these down to four because of the time, but the first thing and one of the biggest things with past was frames per second, and let's throw in the high refresh rate of the display screen. As you can see with the 30 frames second down the bottom in a fast thing, it's very static. Uh, no, not static, stuttery. That feeling makes you very, very queasy. Uh, even looking at that, I'm having issues. So if you have your whole reality doing that, you will not feel well, uh, to the point of nausea, dizziness, headaches, eye strain, you name it. Now, with this, all we need is basically better computers. We have very good computers now, we have very good headsets, so this is basically under control. Uh, what you want, though, is 90 frames per second. Now, with virtual reality, you actually render two screens, not one. So all of those great video games that you see with one screen, all of that quality goes to half. So we need twice the computer. So yeah, first one, frames per second. Next one is latency. This was in the 90s. Uh, as you can see, it's <laughs> not great. Um, latency is when you move in the real world and the result in the virtual world. 
So you want about 10 milliseconds of difference, otherwise it'll feel very not so good. At the moment we're up to 40 milliseconds between an action and a reaction in the virtual realm, which is pretty good, um, but it can get better than that. This is where we're at now. Uh, so as you can see, the difference between the 1990s and last year is significant. Um, I'll probably be putting this game up after this uh, talk, so if you want to have a go, uh, let's all be Jedi's. <laughs> um, now there are technical issues with this pipeline to get the real world to the virtual world. Um, part of that is uh, predicting where the user is going to look, or what they're going to use, and there's a lot of other technical things like time warp and Cody things that I don't even know, but they're getting there with that as well. Skip, skip, high resolution, nice screens, that's great. But accurate tracking. Accurate tracking is basically where is your head here and where is it in the virtual world. There are two types. Six degrees of freedom is everything is tracked, uh, basically one to one. So if I move my head like this, it tracks my head always. Three degrees of freedom is just up, down, left, right, and tilt. So if I do this, nothing moves in the world. So you break that immersion because nothing's moving properly. So with the latest headsets now, you actually have cameras facing outwards. Uh, there are no sensors, which I'll be showing you because I have one of the older versions. Um, but the headset itself can track in the six degrees of freedom without any external sensors, which is great. Uh, much easier to set up in the real world. Um, Field of view, we'll look at that as well, but the field of view is how much you can see. Uh, early ones, about that. Uh, now, 110 is pretty big. Um, depending on how much you want to spend, there's even higher field of view if you want it, but it's a bit of money. Sorry about that. Um, and no cables. Uh, we will have cables. As soon as you have a cable, you don't want cables. Um, <laughs> there is a headset out now, which is a standalone headset. No cables, put it on, two controllers, and that's the whole experience. No computer needed, nothing. Uh, and that technology is quite good with pretty recent experiences as well. I'll go into that one later. Next, the other part is the brain, which is all kinds of fun to work with. There are psychological and physiological ways to trick the brain into believing where it is. Uh, once you pass those things, uh, then you can make it believe anything, but you've got to get that there first. Uh, now, movement is one of the biggest issues. Uh, as I said, virtual reality sickness, when your body is moving but your brain isn't, or your brain is moving but your body isn't. This is why sitting experiences, so a car, for example, uh, you think you're sitting but the car is moving, so that's fine. Get rid of the car and you're running, you'll be sick. So this movement is the same, but everything else is having a bit of disconnection. So, uh, dogfight, flying, simulations, uh, racing games, anything where you're sitting and standing in both the virtual and real world is great. Anything else, not so much. So, one way to get around this is teleportation. Or guns, because guns are fun. So, if you see here, there is a blue line that you will project from your controller. Uh, you will point in a direction to show where you want to face and then let go. You will teleport directly there. There is no movement, so you can't get sick. But when you get there, there is disorientation for a second. He even does it for a second, like, where the hell am I? Um, and then gets on the killing. After a while, it does, uh, get, you get used to it pretty quickly, actually. Teleportation is a pretty easy system to understand and get used to. Um, the other problem with this, though, is the immersion. When you're teleporting in a science fiction sort of story, that's fine. They have teleportation in the future. But a 1940s crime thriller, teleportation wasn't invented yet, so we don't really have that. So if you have teleportation in a theme that doesn't make sense, you will be removed from that experience once again, which isn't really good. So how do we make movement work? Um, next one. This one is... <laughs> Don't break the fantasy. Now, it's very hard to find exactly real-world examples of glitches that you might see in VR, so I had some other ones that are more interesting. So that plant is actually a real plant at one of the developers' uh, studios, but it is a prime example of what you call 
clipping. Clipping is when something that shouldn't go through a wall goes through a wall. And if you see that in your real world, then you're not in the real world and the immersion is done. Uh, hands through people's faces, also not so real, hopefully. <laughs> so if you see that, once again, you'll be pulled out of that experience, which is not what you want. Uh, VR has the ability to 100% take you where you are, but it is very, very easy to pull you out of it. Uh, with normal video games, you get close to an immersive game, but it's a much more difficult thing to get pulled out of. Uh, these are some examples of what happens when it doesn't work. So, back to movement and creating something that you can buy into. One game, as you can see here, is a running game which is all about locomotion and tricking the brain into thinking that you're running while you're not. So, your controllers actually have to go like that. So basically your whole torso and up is 100% buying into the reality that is before you. This is Mario Kart on, like, shoes, basically. Uh, Power-ups and everything. So you look and you run around, it's all a race, and if you are comfortable with VR experiences, you could probably do this okay. Uh, sometimes people get a little sick with it, but once again, you can get used to it. Because it's, it's an interesting game, and you can fly, you can climb, you can do all sorts of things, and once again, you can buy into that experience quite well. So, making a one-to-one -one connection from the real world and the virtual world as much as possible, and you will get less sick. Uh, there is an interesting example where a uh, team put a 3D nose in the virtual reality space. Uh, users were told to play two games of the same experience, one with a nose and one without, and they said, yeah, that second one was so much better, but I don't know why. Because you have a nose. <laughs> you live with your nose. Your brain turns it off, but you know it's there. If it's something closer to reality in the 3D one, even something as subtle as a nose, you will feel more comfortable with that experience and therefore buy into it even more. So making a connection from the real world and the false world is one way to get around some of these problems. Lastly is you're making a game. In many cases, you want to make it fun. So Medal of Honor, which is one of the biggest shooters, have created uh, a game coming out next year and they found that Pulling guns out of the holster is a very, very fun experience. I am a badass, I'm so cool. But trying to put them back in, not, not so much. So they found that a lot of users said, I don't like that part. And once again, you get pulled out of the experience. So instead of a realistic shooting game, as soon as you let go of the guns, they snap back to your hands and you're fine. Loved it, they thought it was great, and you are 100% immersed. And the bottom one here, Robo Recall, you basically throw the guns away and pull up some new ones. <laughs> <laughs> it is really cool throwing guns at bad guys, <laughs> catching the bullets, throwing the bullets back at those guys. And yeah, uh, it's uh, all part of the fun. And that was one of the first games that came out, and it was a very, very good experience. Teleportation also used in that one. So, now that you know what makes a good VR experience, let's find out why they failed so miserably in the past. <laughs> in 1987, they created the iPhone, E-Y-E phone. Uh, they had a data glove as well, which was pretty cool, which actually paved the way for the power glove. If you know what a power glove is, I know exactly how old you are. So. In 1995, uh, they created the VFX1, which was PC-based, and the Virtual Boy, uh, which you may have heard of as well. Uh, the Virtual Boy had no tracking. Uh, imagine two Game Boys here <laughs> and playing that. Um, and that was based on the Virtual Boy. Now, the picture I had before is this one here. Um, five to six frames per second. Um, latency was, I think it was about 200 to 300 milliseconds. So basically, it's like when you did this, wait for it. <laughs> cool. Uh, so that was basically the latency of that. As you can probably imagine, people got really sick, very uncomfortable, and like, oh wow, this is so great, but I need to stop it now. So that is the first wave of VR. Now these were not good experiences, and from 2000 to 2010, nothing happened because of it. They just did not have the technology. 
the that headset with the hardware needed costed cost two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Anyone have that? Twenty years ago. <laughs> so no. So the first wave of the early state of VR was not ideal, um, as Doug <laughs> explains so it so well. Image. Now, <laughs> I don't have the voice for it. I'm not going to do it. But there. Soon after, in 2010, this guy, Palmaki, uh, comes along with a new prototype uh, called the Oculus Rift. Uh, in 2012, he started a Kickstarter and was asking for, how much was it? $250,000 to make the first prototype. $2.4 million later, he had his money and he started it. Facebook also came along and said, you know what, that's a good idea, here's $2 billion, I'll take the whole thing. Uh, with that, uh, he managed to create the first Oculus Rift. So I actually have the commercial version of the Oculus Rift here today. Uh, since then, they've come a long way, but this one's still a pretty good system. So, to develop kits and the commercial version, they originally came out with the gamepad, but then they created the touch controllers. These are also tracked, very gun-like controls, very intuitive. Uh, they were actually very felt really good. You could pick up things very very quickly. M most people can pick up things <laughs> very very quickly. After that, things went pretty quickly. At the same time, same year, uh, Valve brought out their headset. PlayStation, uh, Sony brought out their headset. Lenovo, Acer, uh, Pimax, more Valve, more companies, all sorts of things. Slightly better, slightly bigger, slightly everything. Uh, there's a few. This isn't all of them. This is just some of the bigger ones. At the same time, early on, uh, because price was such a big issue, all of those would need a high-end PC, $2,000 or so. Uh, people with more money than cents may have a couple. <laughs> so, with price being a problem, we moved into the mobile VR headsets. You use your smartphone and a headset, and the experience was okay. Uh, three degrees of freedom, so up, down, left, right, and drift. So if you're watching a movie, 15 minutes later, <laughs> you would have to bring it back. And it was fun, it was gimmicky, lots of roller coasters that made people feel sick. <laughs> Welcome to VR. Um, but they had that. Now, Google Cardboard is literally a headset made of cardboard. So it was like $5 and a smartphone, and you've got a VR experience. Like last one, but nevertheless. That said, this year, due to lack of interest, basically, they've shut the whole thing down. So, no more mobile VR. That said, <laughs> we're at one stage where I said before the standalone headset. It's a dedicated uh, smartphone level uh, technology, basically. It has two controllers, six depth degrees of freedom because it uses cameras facing out, and that's all you need. It costs about $600. And that is your complete VR experience that has 100% tracking, and it's very good. It seems to be the sweet spot in cost, technology, and now can be plugged into a high-end computer for high-end experiences, and eventually they will have hand tracking as well. So it's basically all in one for roughly 70,000 70, yen, that's a cool. Now, you know what it is to do good VR, you know a bit, very quick history of consumer home user headsets. Now let's look at how people are using it in the real world. Uh, first up, of course, you have uh, location-based technology. Um, you have the void up there, which has a very large open space where you walk around, generally shooting zombies, or Marvel and Star Wars have also uh, used their IP for this technology. Mario Kart uh, racing in VR is very fun. You can actually pick up the shell and throw it at people. <laughs> Uh, that's in Tokyo, if you ever get up there for VR Zone, lots of fun. Uh, roller coasters are reinvigorating their uh, whole experience by putting VR and putting them wherever they want to be. And Germany opened up a water slide park with VR headsets, so you can experience whatever you want going down on water. They also have a pool where you put a headset on and a breathing apparatus and go swimming with virtual whales and fish uh, with the feeling of actually being underwater. So it's being used in all sorts of interesting places with entertainment. But let's go a bit more interesting. Communications, of course, 
uh, the pinnacle of technology for uh, smartphones and uh, teleconferencing and all that sort of thing. With presence, even though you're using an avatar that looks like that, um, it feels like someone is actually there. The head movements, the hand movements, which are the two things you mostly track when you're talking to someone, is 100% real time. So you really buy into the fact that someone is there, even though it looks like those guys. Uh, you can of course choose how you look, uh, which sometimes helps people choose whatever they want to be. Um, and of course you have the ability to use creativity like uh, in there, but of course you can use that with um, working with other people and other studies, for example. Next, education is actually one of the biggest industries after entertainment. Um, schools, language, science, history, you name it, you can create that experience in VR. Um, I'm looking forward to the point where they can start emulating real-world situations, for example, science experiments. If you come from Australia, you can't do anything fun anymore because everything is dangerous in Australia. So imagine being able to put two chemicals together and actually exploding your hands into little pieces. That would be great. I would learn a lot from that. <laughs> um, very quickly. Um, of course, when it comes to collaboration, you have an environment that you can work with others with visuals in front of you. Uh, that you can create in real time and use uh, lots of physics and things like that to actually start thinking in a very, very interesting way. Uh, I would also go there. Uh, yeah. So when it comes to history as well, uh, there's a lot of things called photogrammetry which allows you to 3D scan a whole environment. So imagine once we get to the point where we're not allowed to go to certain places or um, being able to protect areas that we're not allowed to go to, we can still travel to those locations in VR and get the same experience, basically. So that's pretty good as well. Visualization is a very big field. Uh, construction, um, industrial design, that's one. Real estate, engineering. Um, it saves a lot of time and money before even putting the first brick down. Uh, you can put the physics involved. You can get uh, visualizations of all of the things there. Some of those aren't real. The second one is, though. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of companies that are investing a lot of money in visualization before they actually uh, do anything on the factory floor. Physically challenged. Uh, people who cannot walk or rehabilitation or those who are in uh, bed for a long period of time. Uh, VR allows people to feel better about their situation and the fact they can still experience things outside of that environment. Using gamification, <laughs> people can be more motivated to get better. Um, moving forward with their rehabilitation um, and VR is being used in many different ways to create a more interesting experience for all of those people involved. Uh, mental health is kind of a newer area. Uh, if you're scared of spiders, uh, having a huge spider coming at you and then the uh, therapist like throwing spiders at you uh, could be all sorts of fun. Um, but in a controlled environment, uh, using exposure therapy, you can start dealing with some of those phobias in a real-ish way, uh, but also a very controlled environment. So depending on how scared you are, it might be fine to do that. Uh, therapy has also found that uh, people with avatars are more willing to open up because the feeling of presence is definitely more real than, say, a webcam or teleconference. Um, and also the limited uh, reactions of the facial expressions of an avatar uh, allow someone to feel less judged. Um, so they can actually open up faster and uh, quicker to the people that they're getting therapy with. Um, there was a statistic somewhere here where they had veterans dealing with PTSD had an average improvement of 37% uh, dealing with uh, problems in the, in the situations that they were dealing with. Um, so I'm assuming that this will actually uh, develop into some very serious uh, therapies in the future. Um, and of course tourism. So these are some examples of photogrammetry. That is actually video game graphics. Um, so they actually, Epic Games I think, which were one of the biggest games companies in the world, went to, this is Steam Channel I think it is, yeah. Um, photogrammetry, photogrammetrized the whole thing um, and created a very realistic version of it that runs in the standalone headset um, because of how they got it working and it's uh, pretty much one-to-one -one recreation you don't have to deal with the crowds you don't have to deal with anyone you can walk around you can teleport you have all of that experience to work through pretty much anywhere you want 
A uh, lot of companies can do photogrammetry now, it's quite cheap, I've done it before, um, it doesn't take very long. Um, programs do it all for you, it's like here you have some photos and then you have a 3D environment for you. Not professional, but it looks pretty good either way. Uh, it's lots of fun. So yeah, those are just some of the areas that VR is being used in outside of video games. Uh, as the technology is cheaper, is easier, more accessible, um, the development tools for VR are being very, like they're actually free and accessible and easy to learn because there's so many people using it that other industries will be able to get involved that wouldn't be otherwise uh, trying to do so anyway. So, yeah. so, we've looked at good VR experiences, we've looked at a very quick history, and we've looked at perhaps some, not all, of the practical applications of VR in the real world. Now, as I have no idea how long my timer is, because I didn't put it on there. Uh, ah, great. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for listening. I hope you have got a bit of an understanding of VR, and uh, hopefully you can all have a shot, um, as I set it up after this talk. Uh, any questions? Thank you. So, as a consumer, what do you think is the biggest obstacle for people accessing VR? As a, as a consumer. Yep, yep, yep. Before this year, it was price. Um, mm -hmm. So, if you're looking at a, a headset and the computer to have a very good experience, you're looking at two and a half grand, uh, 250,000 yen, just to get the computer and the headset that has that. Um, as of May this year with the standalone headset, $600. So that's still pricey, but as smartphones are more expensive than that, I think a lot of people can buy into the fact that this isn't something you can work with. Also, the, the stigma of you will get sick. Um, so many people have had bad experiences in the past, where it's like, I felt terrible, it was the worst thing I've ever been on, I never want to do it again, um, and that sticks around for a long time. So it's very easy to ruin an experience, but it's very hard to actually convince them that that is not a thing anymore. It is still a thing. <laughs> I'm not going to say it's not, um, but it definitely, definitely has improved a lot. And there are choices with locomotion and game choices to reduce that level of that. So I've had some people who, if you get motion sick, you're probably going to have problems. If you don't get motion sick, you'll probably be able to do it fine. So price um, and stigma, I think, would probably be the main ones. Um, one of those is fixed. <laughs> Um, you, I think you've already explained it, but just so it's clear with me. Yeah. Uh, so, how have they resolved the whole moving around in VR? Right. You talked about teleporting, etc. Yep, yep, right. yep. Yeah. Uh, once again, I zipped through a few things because um, it was really hard to get down to 20 minutes. But um, one of the things that they found is um, having a reticle, like just a point, like one pixel in your eyesight on each eye, is enough to reduce the effect. Um, your eye is focusing on something when you're moving it, and that helps. Um, other programs have done it so when you move, uh, a sort of a vignette, so the edges of the screen space will go darker, so it keeps your focus more aligned in one point. Um, I think the peripheral problem and the, the lag, even at the resolutions and refresh rates that they have now is a problem, but if you limit that problem by focusing on one point, which is okay, it does reduce the, the problems there. So partly is software uh, approaches or just uh, cheats like that. Um, the other part is making the connection between the real world and the, the, the virtual world. So if you're running, your arms are actually doing this and that is enough to actually reduce the effect of uh, problems. Right. So, so they're, they're working around the whole moving thing by having you move your upper body and yep. your lower body. Yeah, uh, the brain is very gullible. So if your body is half thinking that you're running, that's a much higher percentage of zero. Um, and that does reduce the actual effect of virtual uh, reality sickness. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of other things. Um, most of it does come down to moving slower, um, reducing head bob. Um, so the first games had the original head bob from PC games, which made everybody sick. Like, <laughs> let's not do that. And that was one step in the right direction. They're still figuring it a lot about, actually. But this year was the first year where it's like, okay, we can make a comfortable experience, not a great experience, but a comfortable experience with locomotion. It depends on how susceptible you are to it, but it can be done. Yes, sorry. Um, on the technology side, um, I know that 
extend it to our legs, so we're going to have like a, a running pad. I could see, I don't know, a treadmill type of thing. <laughs> They've had those for a few uh -huh. years now. Okay. They are ridiculously expensive. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, okay. So, yes, if you have the money, you can do it. But the problem with those sort of uh, peripherals, you would say, is one, cost. Uh, two, the software has to support it. So if you have a game that's great and it works with it, that's excellent. But because they're such a very niche sort of thing, yeah. no one really develops for it. So like when you've got an audience of five people, you're not going to make big games for it. Um, that said, in the future they probably will. Uh, there's two main types. There is a flat treadmill that does guess where you're going and you walk in a direction and you will walk in virtual space. Another one is the treadmill is basically a half dome, like a very, very shallow one, with frictionless shoes. Um, so basically you slide. This is real. This is real. I've done it. It's, it takes a get to use to. So you basically fall forward constantly. So it's like works. It's a bit of a workout because yeah. you're constantly stabilizing. But it gives you the sensation that you're sort of running, but it doesn't really work great. So in the future they will probably get to that. But for home use, probably not. Um, they're just too big and expensive. But if you went to a location-based experience, yes, they do have them. Um, I'm assuming in the future they'll be better, cheaper, faster, and all of that. But we're a little ways away from that yet. Okay. I think we've run out of time. If any more questions, if you want to talk to Matt about anything else, chat with him. Also, grab him and do some VR, yes. beat saber stuff. <laughs> we're going to be setting up something right here. Yeah, yeah. we're going to have it right here for a good while. Up. I'll eat my work. <laughs> <laughs>